and uh, welcome. This is uh, Dr. David Fern, uh, the University of Warwick, here to talk to you about Homer and uh, archaic Greek epic. This is an Ask an Academic Warwick Classics Network video. Uh, responding to some questions that have been sent in. Uh, so we have a bundle of questions that I'm going to answer or try to answer or try to negotiate answering, evading answering um, uh, from a, a number of places, a number of uh, uh, really interesting uh, questions that everybody wants to know the answers to with Homer. And I'm going to try to give you some kind of responses to um, the questions that get you more engaged with the ways the poems work and the way the transmission and reception of the Iliad and Odyssey uh, manifested itself and why that matters. So uh, questions. Um, so Robert McLean from Leicester Grammar School uh, sent uh, in a question from his A-level classical civilization pupils, uh, which is, does the characterization of Odysseus in the Odyssey change over the course of the poem? Uh, I'm going to come to that question uh, in, I think, probably the second half of what I'm going to be saying. But it's it's going to be kind of bound in with quite a lot of the other things I'm going to be saying. So bear that question in mind uh, while I answer the other questions or attempt to negotiate them. All the questions are fabulous. Kind of quite general, but also quite, quite you know, the, the questions that people really want to know. About, the, about Homer and the sense in which they are asked um, is, is kind of driven by um, that kind of, there's a kind of desire there to, to know, um, which is driven naturally by the, the nature of the nature of the poems. Um, we also had uh, uh, Ryan Jacob Barclay from New College Swindon uh, send in the following questions from her A-level students. Um, what do I personally think about Homer? Was he blind? Was he many people? Did he exist? Why is the Odyssey considered integral to literature? How much of an impact would the epics have had on ordinary people's lives? For example, how often were they performed? So altogether, I'm going to take these questions kind of all together, but I'm going to talk um, more, more as I go on about characterization in the Odyssey more specifically. What I'm going to do first is get to grips with or try to get to grips with um, the question, what do I personally think about Homer? Who was he? Was he blind? Did he even exist? Um, and I'm going to do that uh, through a number of ways. It's a really difficult and in some senses impossible question to answer. But there are a couple of ways of uh, getting into the nature of the problem. One is to explore, particularly in the question of, uh, was he blind? Uh, the poetic evidence, the nature of the evidence from antiquity, uh, which surveys that and and gets involved with that question about who Homer was as a person, where was he from, that kind of thing. So poetic or literary evidence, how I assess the literary evidence to generate my own ideas, my own scholarly views about this problematic issue. Uh, it, it's worth saying that the question, who was Homer, is the most problematic question, famously the most problematic question of all questions to ever ask about classical antiquity. Um, why that is the case is important because it sheds light on some of these other questions, like why did Homer matter for people's lives? The very pressing nature, the very prominence of that question, who was Homer, is itself important to recognise and feel as a question that the ancients themselves were already asking, as some of our evidence will show. Um, so I'm going to start with with this question. And I'm going to start with um, a couple of 
a couple of points. The first point is to say that um, on the nature of the poetic, beyond the nature of the poetic evidence, in terms of what the poems actually say, uh, a lot of research has been conducted since the early 20th century in investigating the nature of Homeric verse, the nature of Homeric poetry as poetry, the kinds of ways in which we can find parallels in, or could, could have found parallels in, in the modern world for the nature of its, 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 its poetics, as it were, that sheds light on um, the complexities of the question about who Homer was in new lights. So why, why, why it's worth asking, was Homer many people, uh, is because that gets us thinking about that, that kind of, that, that uh, reveals uh, an underlying perception that there might be something about Homeric poetry that isn't, that makes it different from the kind of things we, we, we generally read and consume today as written texts. Why that's important is because um, in the 20th century, Homeric scholarship, Homeric scholars, American scholars went into the field to do comparative anthropological field work to find uh, contemporary, or at least in the 20th century, contemporary oral traditions that they could, um, they, that they discovered that they used to articulate and explain how the actual building blocks of Homeric verse worked. So here we have the work of Milman Parry and Albert Lord, who um, were the instigators of the oral um, analysis of Homeric verse. And why they're important is because they showed, fundamentally, truthfully revealed that the nature of Homeric verse in its line on line buildup of phrases and expressions is itself formulaically derived. So it's built up out of pre ready made blocks of expressions that fit in particular places in the metrical units of the hexameter line um, that uniquely, pretty uniquely, uh, fit a particular expression. So when you read Homer and you feel like, you know, um, you feel like lines or phrases are re repeated frequently, and that's a really, really obvious characteristic of Homeric poetry that you find these formally, as it were, repeated frequently through the poem. Well, um, the, the anthropological insight from the comparative field work was to say, well, this is the product of an oral tradition. Uh, and that the, the question of who wrote the who wrote the Iliad and Odyssey is in a sense misconceived. That what, what they, these scholars showed really well was that the poems that we have were, were at least the result of uh, presumably a centuries old process of composition in or oral composition in performance kind of modern parallels might, you know, might, you might think of, might think of jazz, for instance. Um, it's good to kind of place to go. There are lots of other kind of contemporary uh, oral traditions where poems, poems and songs are handed down as kind of heirlooms. Uh, the ideas of songs and are handed down as heirlooms, but constantly re redefined, reformed through ongoing um, re-articulation in performance. Um, and there's a sense in which um, uh, the formulaic nature of Homeric verse as we have it now, at least um, reveals itself as being orally derived. Um, the controversy then moves on a stage to say, well, okay, that's all very well, but how did it get in the books we have? And at what stage did it become a text? in the ways that we can, we generally understand texts as texts today. Um, and that, that's a, a more difficult 
much more challenging, much more controversial question to answer now. Um, because ultimately we, we have no idea. The scholarship is, is extremely kind of fraught and uh, controversial on this issue. Um, some scholars want to say that the Homeric poems were not set in stone in, in, in a kind of solidified textual form as we understand textual form to be today until really, really quite late um, in the classical period. In the classical period, right? Some people think that Homeric poems were continually ongoingly reperformed and recomposed in performance through into the into the in the classical period. Um, other scholars, and I think they're more likely to be correct, show think that um, the poems as we have them were set in roughly the the form we have them in the eighth or seventh centuries BC, and the nature of uh, arche certain certain kind of uh, references or allusions or intertexts or whatever we call them, references in archaic poetry uh, belie uh, or reveal a, 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 a Homo recognizably the same as the one we understand in our texts today. But ultimately the question of who was Homo? Did he exist? Did he write the poems down? himself is not a question we can answer. What we can answer though, and flesh out more correctly, I think, uh, more concretely, is the idea that um, from really quite early on in archaic Greece, um, the epic poetry that a uh, 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 kind of a bunch of epic poetry, a set of epic poems or compositions coalesced around the name Homer at quite an early stage. And that this characterization of a, of a, of a bard, a blind man associated with a particular place was itself kind of uh, generated and formed through um, the process of reading and thinking with uh, and reperforming poetry of this orally derived, or, orally derived form. So moving on now from thinking about comparative anthropology for finding parallels for oral traditions within the formulaic nature of Homeric verse, to look at some kind of passages from Homer onwards that reveal um, the ancients' fascination with thinking about singing and thinking about the identities of singers and uh, their character. So I've got a bunch of passages. I've done a PowerPoint. There's a bunch of passages on the PowerPoint which uh, play this out. Um, so thinking about thinking about Homer as blind or thinking about bards as uh, singers as in some ways, um, some way possibly kind of um, uh, um, disabled is important, an important aspect of the epic tradition of thinking with singers right from the very beginning. This is really important to recognize. So I've got two passages from the Odyssey on the handout, uh, two passages from Ho the Iliad and Odyssey on the handout, on the, sorry, on the PowerPoint. Uh, one very famous one and one perhaps a slightly less known one, which is the first one I start with. So in the catalogue of ships in Iliad book two, um, which describes uh, all the Greek ships and all the places that the Greeks came from to Troy, uh, in the Thracian section of the catalogue, we have this passage Iliad two, five, nine, four to 600, where we have a story about the unfortunate bard Thamyris, who decided that he would boast about his prowess uh, in such a way that the muses were even the muses themselves were offended. He boasted that he would surpass even the muses themselves, daughters of Aegis bearing Zeus, if they were to sing against him. These in anger against him maimed him 
took away his wondrous voice and made him a singer without memory. So the maiming of Thamiris by the Muses is importantly twofold. It's not simply that they took away his wondrous voice. They also took it, took away his memory. In the Greek, he's an eklalathon kithariston, a lyre player with no memory. It's not just that he doesn't have a voice. He hasn't got the memory to remember the songs. How do you remember the songs? You remember the songs by remembering the traditions in which you are brought up, those formulaic blocks that are handed down over generations through the oral tradition. So there's a sign here, even in this, in this really first passage about, um, about poets in the entire tradition, that memory is crucial for singers. Forgetting who you are is of course central to the Odyssey, um, which is a major theme of the Odyssey from the Lotus Eaters episode, for instance. And here we have in the Iliad in the line 600 book two, a really clear sense that memory is integral to the idea that songs can, singers can perform properly and function properly. Uh, so I think inside the poems, we have this sense that the Iliad and Odyssey already know that memory and singing go, go in incredibly closely together. Um, they, they don't tell you that um, poems are generated through tradition, but they give you this, this insight. Um, the second really famous passage is the passage from Odyssey 8, where the Phaeacians bard Demodocus is described. Odyssey 8 describes Odysseus's ongoing distress at the court of the Phaeacians, hearing all these songs that Demodocus is singing about himself and people he, know, he knows at Troy for the greater benefit and entertainment of the Phaeacians. Um, that's important it's, itself because it raises questions about what, what we think Homeric poetry actually is for. What does Homeric poetry do? Are we supposed to take pleasure from this kind of material? Odysseus isn't necessarily always taking pleasure from it himself. Anyway, in this passage from Odyssey 8, line 62 to 5, we have the description again of a singer who'd been maimed by the muse. The muse had loved him greatly and gave him both good and evil. She reft him of his eyes, but she gave him sweet singing art. So Demodocus is the example, another example of a, of a maimed bard, but here the maiming is of, of his eyes, so he's blinded. Uh, and, and Demodocus is by far the most prominent of all the bards that appear in the Homeric poems. So there's a very good chance that the idea that Homer himself was blind, Homer himself was blind, comes out of and is generated out of the reception of and thinking with passages like this characters like Demodocus. This is also reflected in, in tradition, the, the ongoing epic, Homeric epic tradition that's slightly later than uh, the composition time of the, um, the Iliad and Odyssey as reflected in the Homeric hymn to Apollo, which is then picked up and played around with by the great Greek historian Thucydides in book three. Um, so Thucydides in book three in the translation I've got given you on the on the PowerPoint again, sorry that the, the passage is quite small, but I'm trying to fit it all to do two pages on the slide. Um, Thucydides is here recounting, talking about the the um, uh, reorganization of, of the festival uh, of Apollo on the island of Delos in the, the late fifth century BC. He's writing about during the Peloponnesian War. And he uses the Homeric hymn to Apollo as evidence to say that this is a tradition that this is a festival that used to happen a lot and has now gone into abeyance. And this is also an opportunity for Thucydides, quite rarely and quite unusually for him, to go in for a bit of kind of scholarly digging 
uh, kind of enterprise work for thinking about who Homer himself already was. So he quotes, uh, Thucydides quotes a Homeric hymn to Apollo, who he is, the, the hymn to Apollo, who he, who he's, whose authorship he associates with Homer himself. Homer, Homer above all shows that this took place in the following verses from the hymn to Apollo. Okay, so that's uh, on page 180 of the translation here. And then he talks about um, uh, how Homer, as it were, praises himself. Uh, Maidens, which man comes here sweetest you, to, you, to you of all bards, and you delight most in him. Answer him well, all of you, not saying my name, a blind man and he lives on rocky Chios. Homer, Thucydides continues, has given us all this evidence that long ago there was also a great assembly and festival on Delos. And later the Athenians would go forth and continue to do so. So this, is, this passage is, is fascinating and important because it shows that by the time of Thucydides at the end of the fifth century BC, the Greeks, the Athenians, the Greeks were already obsessed with the question of who Homer was and the traditions associated with him and the festivals that were associated, associated with him, the places, the places that where his work were performed, as well as the places that claimed him as a, um, as a cultural icon. That's all really important stuff. So to end uh, this question about the question of Homer, who do we think Homer was? Well, the answer is we don't have an answer to that question. Can't give you an answer to that. But there's a variety of material going through from um, the, the epic texts themselves through to the fifth century BC, which gives a very strong flavor to the idea that the very question of associating um, the bard with certain physical and geographical characteristics was something the Greeks themselves were com completely obsessed with. Um, and just to, just to finally prove this point, uh, I give you the, the final passage to answer this question from Lucian, from his Vera Historiae, True Story, which is the next page on the next slide on the handout. Lucian is a Roman imperial writer, satirist. Um, uh, his true story is this is crazy, pa uh, paradoxical, lying escapade where he goes on a journey and encounters all these crazy things and all these people from the past, including Homer, where and this is this encounter here. And uh, Lucian uses the opportunity to meet with Homer to ask him all the questions that everybody wants to have answered, right? Above all, I said, where do you come from? This point in particular is being investigated even yet at home. I'm not unaware, said he, that some think me a Kean, the use the Homeric hymn to Apollo. Some are Smyrniote and many are Colophonian. As a matter of fact, I'm a Babylonian and among my fellow countrymen, my name was not Homer, but Tigranes. So Lucian um, kind of blowing raspberries at anybody who thinks that they actually know where Homer was, where Homer was from, that he was a Greek at all. Lucian is poking fun at, at the, the certainties, the pedantries, as it were, of Homeric scholarship, uh, even in antiquity, that was obsessed with this question. Uh, and I went on to inquire whether the bracketed lines had been written by him. So this is Lucian in the second century AD kind of questioning the entire tradition of the scholarly, scholarly kind, of, um, um, uh, kind of industry going on since at least as early as the fourth and fifth centuries BC into thinking with Homer and associating lines with Homer and ideas with Homer and then the scholarship on the actual text of Homer and figuring out, thinking about which lines were genuine lines by Homer and which, which lines you could put brackets around, as it were, and not genuine. And, and Lucian says, well, they're all mine, Homer says. So Lucian consequently held 
Grimerian Sinologus and Aristarchus, two of the most famous Homeric scholars of antiquity, guilty of pedantry in the highest degree. So other, other kind of lampoons here. Uh, he, since he had, he had answered satisfactorily on these points, I next asked him why he began with the wrath of Achilles, and he said it just came into his head that way without any study, which is a joke about muse invocations and the ways in which Homeric bards, Homeric singers in the epics themselves say that um, they're, they're kind of semi-divinely kind of influenced for their information. Again, that, that really famous important passage in Iliad 2, the music in, invocation in the catalogue of ships that, that, that talks about this. Uh, and finally here, that he was not blind as they say, I understood at once, I saw it and so had no need to ask. I saw him with my own eyes and he wasn't blind, so that's the end of that story. Right. Lucian, a true story, which isn't a true story at all, poking fun at the entire history of a Greco-Roman interest, and indeed, in some senses, pedantry, scholarly pedantry, uh, in answering these questions. This all matters hugely, of course, for our depth of knowledge and interest about the ways in which Homer and what Homer meant to the ancient Greeks and Romans um, uh, was so kind of culturally embedded, so culturally ingrained, so important. You can't move in Greek culture or Roman culture without thinking about what Homer is and what Homer means when you read anything really, um, because all classical literature is ultimately so so entirely kind of um, uh, uh, devoted to or uh, um, uh, inspired by, as it were, uh, the epic tradition of storytelling. <laughs>